I, as many people in science communication, am fascinated with flat earthers. Here you have a group of people steadfastly rejecting evidence that's right in their face. Flat earthers are neither stupid nor anti-scientific. And the only thing we are steadfastly objecting is a fantasy spinning ball earth and the endless straw man arguments and non-empirical claims made by its proponents. But first I have to tell you what flat earthers actually believe and how they got there. You have absolutely no idea what flat earthers believe, as you are about to demonstrate, but just your use of the word believe is already wrong. The earth is demonstrably, empirically, a level motionless plane. The natural physics of water objectively proves this, and everyone who has ever lived has experienced themselves existing upright on a motionless level plane. Belief is not required or a factor in people knowing the earth to be motionless and level. For the members of your heliocentric cult, however, belief is most certainly required, as there is no demonstrable empirical evidence proving earth to be a tilting, wobbling, spinning, oblate pear hurtling around the sun. Fairy tales like this must be believed, unlike our actual experience of the motionless level earth, which can be objectively demonstrated. The most popular flat earth model is that of a disk where the north pole is in the middle and the south pole is an ice wall on the edge of the disk. They mostly agree though that gravity does not exist and that the observations we normally attribute to gravity come instead from the upward acceleration of the flat earth. The statement that flat earthers mostly agree the effects of gravity are caused by an upward accelerating flat earth disk is the most blatantly dishonest thing said in this presentation. No flat earther in history ever believed or even presented this ridiculous theory until it was included on the farcical, satirical, controlled opposition Flat Earth Society website, frequently asked questions, in the early 2000s. I have not found a single flat earther outside of the Flat Earth Society who believes or promotes that misinformation, and the tens of thousands of flat earthers on my channel will back me up on this. Please comment below if anyone actually believes Earth is an upward accelerating disk. The actual explanation for the effects of so-called gravity are as follows. Quite simply, objects fall or rise based on their relative density to the medium surrounding them. Apples fall because they are denser than the air, while helium balloons rise because they are lighter. No gravity necessary. This is why raindrops fall down through the air, and air bubbles rise up through water. Everything seeks its relative density and rises or falls until settling accordingly. This is why a tiny pebble sinks to the bottom of the ocean, but gigantic cruise ships and aircraft carriers stay afloat on the surface, because even though a pebble is so small, its mass, relative to its volume, its density, is more than water, so it sinks. And even though a cruise ship is so large, its mass, relative to its volume, is less than water, so it floats. If Newton's apple had landed in a puddle instead of on his head, he would have seen the apple only fell through the air because it was denser than the air but then floated on top of the water because it was less dense than water. Have you ever noticed how it's easier to stay afloat with your lungs full of air than it is when they're empty? Submarines float on the surface when their ballast tanks are filled with air, but when the vents are opened and seawater floods in, they begin to sink as the submarine's density becomes greater than water. Depending what depth they wish to dive, sailors simply adjust the ratio of air and water in their tanks, and when ready to resurface, they blow compressed air into the tanks, forcing the seawater out, lowering the density, and thus causing them to rise back to the surface. We can also prove this fact of relative density by filling a balloon with approximately half helium and half air. Since helium is lighter than the oxygen, nitrogen, and other gases that compose the air around us, filling a balloon with just the right amount of helium to compensate for and balance out the density of the plastic results in a gravity-defying, levitating balloon at equilibrium 
that neither rises nor falls. Well, that's not the only problem. You also have to get the moon and the sun to somehow circle around over the disk to explain day and night and the phases of the moon. To get the day-night cycle to be noticeable, you have to shrink the sun and move it closer to the Earth. Since it seems you need a history lesson, be assured it was the heliocentric spinning globe theory which repeatedly changed the size and distance of the sun to fit their model, not the other way around. Geocentric scientists didn't, quote, shrink the sun and move it closer to the Earth. Heliocentric theorists are the ones that drastically expanded the size of the sun and moved it millions of miles away from the Earth. In fact, they have been notorious for regularly and drastically changing the distance to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Copernicus calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be 3,391,200 miles. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was actually 12,376,800 miles away. Isaac Newton once said, it matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. How scientific. Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million miles. Thomas Dilworth claimed 93,726,900 miles. John Hind stated positively 95,298,260 miles. Benjamin Gould said more than 96 million miles, and Christian Mayer thought it was more than 104 million. Nowadays, they have settled on the figure of 93 million miles away for the sun and 240,000 miles away for the moon. But for centuries before these astronomers began pushing the sun further and further away, the sun and moon's size and distance were already known and fixed. Measuring with sextants and calculating with plane trigonometry, both the sun and moon figured to be only about 32 miles in diameter and approximately 3,000 miles away. Anyone can see and empirically measure for themselves that the sun and moon are nearly the same size, but heliocentrists claim the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. Anyone can also see and measure for themselves that the sun and moon are nearly the same distance away from Earth but heliocentrists claim the sun is 400 times further away than the moon. But even with those assumptions, the size of the sun will change during the day more than we observe. The apparent size of the sun may or may not change during the day depending on various atmospheric conditions, such as air pressure, humidity, and temperature. You can observe this for yourself by watching time-lapse footage of the sun. Also, as only consistent with the geocentric model, the sun changes its apparent shape as it moves away from the observer, going increasingly oblong the further it travels. And no one has ever successfully predicted solar eclipses on a flat Earth or calculated the observed motions of the planets. Many people think that modern astronomy's ability to accurately predict lunar and solar eclipses is a result and proof positive of the heliocentric theory of the universe. The fact of the matter, however, is that eclipses have been accurately predicted by cultures worldwide for thousands of years before the heliocentric ball Earth was even a glimmer in Copernicus's imagination. Ptolemy in the first century AD accurately predicted eclipses for 600 years on the basis of a flat stationary Earth with equal precision as anyone living today. All the way back in 600 BC, Thales accurately predicted an eclipse which ended the war between the Medes and Lydians. Eclipses happen regularly with precision in 18-year cycles, so regardless of geocentric or heliocentric, flat or globe Earth cosmologies, eclipses can be accurately calculated independently of such factors. The Flat Earth Society goes back to an Englishman by name Samuel Rowbotham, who lived in the 19th century. He was a medical doctor who believed he had proved that the Earth is flat and then complained for the rest of his life that the supposed scientific authorities ignored him. Samuel Robotham founded the Universal Zetetic Society, not the Flat Earth Society. The Flat Earth Society is a controlled opposition group that mixes truth with lies and satire to discredit genuine Flat Earth research, a job they have been doing for a long time now. Founded in 1970 by Leo Ferrari, a suspected Freemason and philosophy professor at St. Thomas's University, 
Leo spent his life making a mockery of the legitimate subject of our flat earth. Though he passed away in 2010, his Flat Earth Society still exists today online as a website and forum which, still true to form, purports several false Flat Earth arguments and treats the entire subject as a deadpan joke. After Robotham's death in 1884, the Flat Earth idea was carried forward by another British guy, Samuel Shunton. In 1954, Shunton created the International Flat Earth Society. Few people cared. He died in 1971. After his death, the Flat Earth Society was taken over by the US American Charles Johnson. But even after the advent of the internet, Flat Earthers did not attract much attention. Johnson died in 2001, at which point the Flat Earth Society had 3,500 or so members. The job then fell to another American, Daniel Shunton, who is not related to the earlier Shunton, but whose logic falls right in line. The IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society, was the spiritual successor to Robotham's Universal Zetetic Society, and neither of these had anything to do with the Flat Earth Society, which you keep claiming and whose logo you keep showing. Robotham, Shenton, and Johnson were the original operators of genuine Flat Earth groups long before Leo Ferrari created his farcical Flat Earth Society in 1970. After Johnson and Ferrari's deaths, Daniel Shenton took over the satirical organization and has been running it ever since, ruining the good names and work of the original International Flat Earth Research Society and Universal Zetetic Society. To give an idea of how the controlled opposition works, consider the example of Leo Ferrari's pumpkin-sized rock he would always take during interviews and lectures, claiming he brought the stone back from the edge of our flat earth. He would say with a huge smirk on his face how his boat had fallen over the edge, but he was luckily saved by hanging onto this rock. Clearly, treating our flat earth in this tongue-in-cheek way discouraged people from taking the matter seriously. Ferrari's entire shtick involved approaching the flat earth subject from every angle except the rational and scientific. Shanton had the idea to set up a wiki page for the flat earth community. Still, no one cared, but in 2016, everything changed. What happened in 2016 is that a few devout Flat Earthers put up videos here on YouTube. And that really got things going by way of recruiting new believers. Not to toot my horn, but the modern Flat Earth resurgence, the moment when the Flat Earth tides shifted and the exponential growth of the current movement began, as shown by Google Analytics, was clearly around and after November 2014, the exact month when I exploded all of my Flat Earth research onto the internet. In November 2014, I published the first pro-Flat Earth book written in 50 years, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, along with several popular articles and videos on the subject, garnering over 40 million views on my first channel alone, began giving radio interviews, restarted Charles Johnson's Eifers, and soon published 200 Proofs Earth is Not a Spinning Ball, to this day the most viewed Flat Earth video and most read Flat Earth book of all time. These simultaneous actions, my intentional exploding of credible flat earth information onto the internet all at once, which I had been preparing for years before, were undoubtedly the catalysts behind the exponential growth curve seen beginning November 2014, and not just the result of some random YouTubers in 2016, as Sabine claims. There is no appealing to authority here. You have totally yourself collected all this evidence about how society works. You have also yourself collected lots of evidence that science works. Any airplane, any laptop, any pair of glasses is evidence that science works. It's evidence that the system works. It's evidence for how the whole world works. So if you cannot recall just what experiments demonstrate that the Earth is not flat, or if you cannot immediately figure out what's wrong with Flat Earthers' arguments, there's no shame in rejecting their claims, because your rejection is based on evidence, evidence that science works. So for anyone having trouble following Sabine's logic, eyeglasses and laptops exist, therefore the Earth is a spinning globe. And if you cannot articulate why you believe such a ridiculous, non-empirical, non-demonstrable claim such as bodies of water clinging to and wrapping around the underside of a tilting, wobbling, spinning sphere, don't be ashamed because, quote, science works.